Look gamers, after the undeniable truth that I'm going to show you today, we got to deal with reality. The console war is dead. But the question that lingers now is, how did we get here? Let's get into it. What's up, peoples? What's up, peoples? What's up, people? It's your boy MM2K back again with another one. Hey, yo, before we get too deep into this one, can you do me a huge favor? Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Rock those bells for notifications, please, so you know when your boy's dropping these doses. I appreciate all of y'all straight up, because I ain't too proud to ask. All right, now let's get into it. Yeah, I said it. The console war is dead. And you're probably thinking to yourself, MM2K, where in the hell do you get that conclusion from? Don't take it from me, baby. You need to take that source straight from the horse's mouth. Or should I say the pony's mouth? Sony, look at your screen. I want to read y'all something. If you look at that slide, it is an authentic slide presented by Jim Ryan of the PlayStation division. And in this presentation, he's talking about Sony's future within gaming. Now I want to read you the vision statement. It says, a massively enhanced PlayStation community where enriched and shared PlayStation experiences can be seamlessly enjoyed independent of time and place, with or without a console. Do you need some time for that to sink in, fanboys? Just let it sink in. I I'll be here all day. Now for the rest of us listening to this video, I will continue on. With not only that, my friends, but the joining of Microsoft and Sony to, to journey into joint ventures and look at the future of cloud gaming together. All the stuff that's been happening within the last 12 months has solidified that Sony, the console giant, the exclusive console giant as far as exclusivity being tied to the box, they are now bowing out of that strategy. And by them bowing out of that strategy, they officially have ended the console war. Now I've been talking to a lot of you guys out there in the social media world, and a lot of y'all thinking to yourselves right now, no, nah, MM2K, no, nah, see, you ain't got it right, man. See, the console war ended when Microsoft decided that they were no longer gonna compete with Sony, you know what I'm saying? And they start coming out with all these 60 games and all this other stuff and a, a whole bunch of other garbage. And I'm here to let you know that could not be the furthest thing from the truth. I get where y'all are going, but y'all are not looking at this from the right prism. So I'm going to help y'all do that, okay? We're going to do this. You know how your boy do it. We're going to do this at three levels. Level one is we're going to talk about the sixth generation. The generation that you're going to see started the demise of the console war in actuality. Then we're going to talk about the seventh gen. Now, in the seventh gen, that's where the feud between Microsoft and Sony was as fiercest, but you're going to see why. That was where things started to turn for the worst for those that encouraged the console war. And lastly, we're going to talk about the 8th gen, where, again, the console war has finally been killed. So let's talk about it. Let's start the 6th generation of console gaming. The original OG Xbox versus the PlayStation 2. Now, for those of you that are up on your history or been around at that time, you got to remember that the only reason why that the Xbox console was greenlit was because Microsoft was fearful that their advantage in the battle for the living room was starting to slip away. Now, if you don't understand what the battle for the living room is, so you gotta, you gotta go back in the space time tub machine, okay? The battle for the living room was indicative of these major corporations trying to control what you watched on TV or how you watch things on TV and where you did your home computing. Because back in that era, technology had it a uh, hamstrung to the living room. And around this time, you just had the follow up of the major, major success of the PlayStation 1 via Sony. And then you had the fact that they were going to take it up another notch with the PlayStation 2 and the introduction of the uh, cheap DVD player, along with it being a console as well. This scared the bejesus out of Microsoft. So Microsoft finally greenlit, greenlit the Xbox gaming console system. Don't believe your boy MM2K? That's all right. Go check on the internet. CNN Money has a particular article that covers this in good detail. It was published May 16th, 2001. Go check it out. It's still out there. So now we're going to segue into the seventh generation, okay? 
In the seventh generation, Microsoft's concerns were even greater. Here you have the release of the PlayStation 3 coming, all right? And the PlayStation 3 had boasted via Sony that it was going to be able to not only do gaming, but do gaming through this elaborate process via its cell processor, but also control your toaster, your refrigerator, a whole bunch of stuff, right? You were going to be able to do this all again via the realm of your what? Living room. Again, the battle for the living room was starting to intensify. Microsoft's whole vision was taking over your living room themselves. So what do they do? They release their seventh gen console very early. Why do I say it's very early? Because the console itself had a 60% failure rate. Yes, the infamous red ring of death. Now let's look at those consoles of seventh generation and look at how they ultimately played out. Sony came out, of course, with the PlayStation 3 with all of its fancy capabilities and doodads. It had other OS, remember that? Again, it's gonna take over your appliances and stuff like that. And then it had the ability to last multiple gens via, again, the cell processor, processor, excuse me, because it was supposed to be so powerful that it would co compete the seventh and eighth generation. Now, you may have had the 360 that, again, had that high failure rate, 60%. However, the system came out with great software, unmatchable multimedia, which was key that generation, and online reliability that has never been seen with gaming. On the flip side, Sony suffered from very high price, a very high price point at $600. Remember the infamous statement from Sony? Go ahead and get two jobs, you know what I'm saying? Just the PlayStation 3 is worth it, you know what I mean? Then you had the also more infamous security beat, Breach. All these hiccups from Sony, with all of the fanfare for the Microsoft unit, the seventh generation, propelled Microsoft to great heights. And it did something that no other console in competition with Sony had done before. It had finally beat the PlayStation console. Not only in consoles sold for the majority of the generation, but in software sales as well, which is the most important thing. So now we're gonna bring this all home to the current generation at the time of this recording, which is the eighth generation. Upon its success in the seventh generation, Microsoft made a horrible assumption that they had captured the minds of the general consumer, not understanding that they just captured the mind of a lot of uh, gamers. Sony then realized that, hey, we can capture the mind of those gamers even better with coming up with a lot of fanfare for them. And then by capturing the mind of those gamers, we can propel ourselves back into an advantage point of taking over the, the living room. They did so and it worked. They backtracked on the DRM that both Microsoft and Sony was supposed to partake in. They came out with a cheaper unit and the unit was more powerful in playing your favorite games from the gate. Astoundingly, in Sony's favor, you had a lot of developers that originally did not favor the PlayStation brand. Developers like Todd Howard from Bethesda, who was doing commercials on how fantastic the PlayStation 4's prospects, prospects look due to its power. That in combination with people like Kojima, maker of the Metal Gear series, saying things like the PlayStation 4 can do 1080p, 60 frames per second with room to spare, propelled the system to heights it never could have imagined from the game. On the flip side of that, <laughs> the, the poor Microsoft Xbox One did not get any favorable fanfare at its launch, to say the least. It was being hammered in the press. And then it wasn't helping that the head of the Xbox division, Donnie Matrick at the time, said things on the reverse, or on the flip side of what uh, people at Sony said with the PlayStation 3. People at the, uh, for the PlayStation 3 said you should get a second job. Donnie D in response to the DRM and the, the fact that the system was gonna be uh, requiring gamers to be online all the time. When they asked about service people, that may want to buy the console that may not have those capabilities donnie d's response was well we got a system for you it's the xbox 360. that again got hammered and put the xbox one in a place that it would never recover from and in response to the poor showing that the xbox one was starting to get in the press and the gap starting to wide between widen between xbox and playstation and again Xbox was integral as well as PlayStation was integral in their respective companies' desire to take over your living room. 
At the prospects of that, Microsoft did some serious restructuring and did a major change at the helm. In comes the Satya Nadella era, out goes the Steve Ballmer era. Now Satya Nadella is more of a cloud guy, okay? And therefore, the prior strategy of we want to take over your living room went out the door. Satya Nadella's approach was we will bring our products to wherever you're at. Satya didn't see the, the, the necessity of wasting all this money just to fight over one space where when he took over in 2014, families didn't do all of their multimedia needs or take care of those needs in just one room, the living room. They were doing it everywhere. Coffee shops, on the porch, in the car, everywhere. So with the strategy of taking over your living room being thrown out the door, then Satya had the question as well, why are we battling Sony so heavily? We are two companies that cross business sectors, he's thinking to himself, but we have two totally different strategies. We can actually be allies. And over the next several years leading up to 2019, Microsoft went on a serious lobbying spree to try to ally with Sony so they can partner in business in some shape, form, or fashion. That was all evident in the praise that Phil Spencer went on at the DICE uh, event, praising Sony games more than he did Microsoft's. Uh, also, in addition to that, uh, the Mixer service, which is owned by Microsoft, their streaming service, their version of Twitch. Uh, they were doing God of War PlayStation 4 Pro giveaways, for crying out loud. And more recently, they invited Sony to come to Microsoft to check out its AR tech. But it's reasonable to believe and to assume that they did their lobbying even harder to get them to go into business with them somehow as far as when it comes to cloud technology and gaming. And by the events that we're going over today, it worked. They have now convinced Sony as well that the battle for the living room would be fruitless in the future. As the living room, again, as I illustrated earlier, became less relevant to their future business strategies. And as the battle for your living room, one particular static room, became fruitless in the minds of these corporations, thus it became the end of the console war as we know it. You're seeing a lot of things happening out in these gaming streets. Sony CEOs, as I've reported earlier, Sony CEOs saying that console gaming is niche and other things going on out here. Sony has done a complete 180 as far as their strategy to gaming, and this is why. So with that being said, if you are a fanboy, particularly a Sony fanboy, who still clings to the belief that your favorite company, Sony, would never do said thing like what they're doing now, <laughs> always understand the business strategy of a company first. Then always keep your head on the swivel and look at the market trends. Then do the math. Because if it don't make dollars for any Fortune 500 company that's publicly traded, then guess what? It don't make sense. And then after you do that math, come and join the rest of us in a land we call reality. And that's it from your boy MM2K. Let me know what you think about what I had to say in the comments section below, because like I always tell you, you can come with me or come at me. It don't matter to your boy. But if you like what I had to say, leave a comment in the comment section below. Hey yo, I do a show with your peoples. Neethals, Dirk Griggity, Snow Bunny. It is called Scram Punks. We do it every Wednesday, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Check it out on my own boy, Dirk Griggity's channel. Look at the PNTS Network for more information. And last but not least, definitely, check out my peoples, my brethren, the broadband bullies. Yo, we doing the damn thing. Yo, check out that link to the Discord, man. We be cutting up in there. Check out the link to the gear and the merchandise. It's fly. And as always, as always, look, y'all, I get it. I get it. Tough pill to swallow. You know what I'm saying? Your favorite company led you to believe one thing and did a, a, a complete 180 in another direction. But don't damage control it. Take off your damn knee pads. Stop the wood buffing. Get to action. Recognize, realize, and strategize. If you don't like what's going on, open your mouth and say something and vote with your wallet. And with that being said, you have a wonderful gaming day.